According to Gori, the picture drawer by now would have mastered the first three steps of drawing, perspective, copying, and plaster rounds. With each progressive step, the student would learn lights and shades, proportions, movement, foreshortenings, and the use of various drawing media to include metal point, chalks, charcoal, watercolors, and ink applied by quill, reed, or brush. Apprentices would have also realized their own drawing savvy within their own natural inclination and invention. However, the next step would ultimately prove their proficiency to become master drawers. Gori writes, Now coming to the fourth step, that is, the life itself of all natural things, which is the best master for imitation and liberty and our only observation, for here is all things to be found, of what is to be found, or ever was inquired after. The young learner would know that nature and life are sufficiently completed in all things, and to imitate the least thing in it requires a hand of the best master. Thus, the picture drawer would apply all that has been learned into the new challenge of understanding and portraying the existence of life itself. Leonardo da Vinci would say, A painter who draws merely by practice and by eye, without reason, is like a mirror which copies all things placed in front of it without being conscious of their existence. You artist must not only believe what you see, you must also understand what you see. In this sketch, the viewer becomes a part of the bustling scene. Everything is set in its proper vantage point, from foreground to the far horizon. Buildings are in their correct perspectives. Each figure, animal, and object is animated with movement and in proper proportions. Consistent lights and shades indicate a strong light source from the left and the overall drawing has an immediate glowing atmosphere filled with life. Such be the necessary reasonings for the visual understandings of a picture drawer to be conscious of the existence of all things. Drawing from the life focused primarily on the human figure. However, before the student would observe a nude model for the first time, the understanding of human anatomy would have already been introduced. Philips Engel would write in 1642, The painter should possess a thorough understanding of anatomy, seeking to imitate nature rather than another master's manner. A good knowledge of anatomy gives the advantage of knowing the muscles properly, where they begin and where they end, how they move, and, in moving, changing their appearance, where they are depressed and where they again protrude, how a body should be divided in order to have fine proportions. To acquire this knowledge, Michelangelo and many excellent artists dissected a number of bodies and split the muscles apart in order to gain full knowledge of the same. By the 17th century, students no longer had access to cadavers, therefore Engel strongly advised Learn under a master artist who is greatly experienced and excels by way of numerous examinations and close observations, noting all the particulars which he observes very keenly in all figures. Early in their training, apprentices would draw from flayed cast sculptures and from human skeletons. By the 1600s, there were also numerous publications with illustrations of the human body from which a picture drawer could learn anatomy. Among the most famous was by Andreas Vesalius, a descendant from a prominent family of physicians in Brussels. He became an army surgeon and later settled in Padua, Italy as a professor of anatomy. He drew many sketches himself directly during dissections However, other artists contributed to illustrating his famous book, De Corpus Humani, first published in 1543. P. 
Peter Paul Rubens, though he may have witnessed dissections, learned human anatomy from live models, but also from personal studies of Greek and Roman statues and anatomical books, especially that of Vesalius and the Spanish anatomist Juan Valverde. While in Italy, shortly after his apprenticeship in Flanders, he made a group of 12 remarkable anatomical drawings, two of which are shown here. These drawings were mostly studied from sculptures of flayed figures sketched from different viewing angles, as seen in the arm studies to the left. The drawing on the right may have been from a different source, regarding Rubens' interest in the construction of anatomical models. In his personal pocketbook, the so-called theoretical notebook, he writes, and I quote, The true method for anatomy is to take a man's bones and connect them properly with iron pins, then gradually dress them in the imitation of real anatomy with fake muscles to be sewn together with lined fashion stuffed with straw. Here we see a black chalk and brown ink drawing as observed by Constantin Daniel van Renesse, who perceived periodic instruction during Rembrandt's life drawing sessions. These gatherings of both students and invited guests were held upstairs in Rembrandt's house and never in his private studio. Rembrandt had, at the most, four or five guild-approved students at a time, and because of his success, he was able to provide them with lodging and meals within his own home, expenses which were included in the total price of the private tutelage. This arrangement was a common guild practice and a responsibility upon guild member master artists. Rembrandt almost always drew alongside his students. He is seen here in the center giving a demonstration. Note that a female nude is being drawn. Artists in the 17th century Netherlands were among the first to employ nude female models into the studio. Up to that time, artists were mostly restricted to use only male models. Artists had to imagine, improvise, and incorporate female features onto a male body, as evident in many early 16th century Italian and Northern European paintings. Artists who were married, like Rubens, Velazquez, and Rembrandt, or had an intimate mistress like Raphael, would gain a better understanding and realistic depiction of the female form. Otherwise, one had to study the ancient sculptures of classical female nudes, refer to anatomy books, or resort to images found in copy books. Of course, respectable ladies in the 17th century did not pose as models, so artists had to sometimes hire prostitutes. Rembrandt students would take turns modeling, and here we see a pose by the same model as seen from different views in a single drawing session. Rembrandt's sketch is in the lower middle. He worked off a copper plate to make an etching, hence the pose is in the reverse. Noteworthy to consider, are the variances of individual style by the three students who drew from the life with brown ink, reed, and quill pens, brushes, and washes. For instance, the far left figure is more refined with anatomical detailing and tighter folds of the garment, so also is Rembrandt's. Note that the face of the model greatly differs in all four images. Hence, the teaching lesson was not about portraiture or exactness, but rather how to render the figure in space. This becomes obvious since all the students have incorporated backgrounds to set off the figure, allowing a sense of depth depicted through lights and shades. Note in the far left drawing that the student, or perhaps Rembrandt himself, arbitrarily placed something in front of the legs with heavier line work to show the spatial depth concept which was so important to 17th century artists. The legs of the middle sketch also appear corrected by Rembrandt as if to enhance a weight-bearing balance. 
In Wilhelm Gorhi's drawing manual, he explains how to arrange the model for drawing. Set your model in a good action and put your model in a place of a convenient light. For the light is a great matter in regard you must seek to obtain the most pleasant shades. The height of your light must be such that the shade which your figure makes upon the ground be equal or a little less than the height of your figure you have to draw after. Gorey also considers that a big room with a high natural light from the north shows upon the figure very pleasantly. In other manuscripts, the light cascading down upon the model is described to be at a 45 degree angle. In his writings, Leonardo da Vinci would also recommend the ideal light in a studio. The light for drawing from nature should come from the north so that it is not subject to change, and if your light comes from the south, keep the windows screened so that when the light shines through the course of the day, the light will not vary. The height of the light should be fixed so that every model's body casts a shadow on the ground which is as long as it is high. It is known that the Dutch painter Vermeer used a thin white sheet to block his southern exposed windows. Aside from proper light upon the model, Gorey emphasizes that there must be some movement in the pose, the turning of a figure, forward, backward, aside, a bended knee, a raised arm, some foreshortening, and so forth. This enabled the student to learn the many changes of the muscles, the distribution of weight, balance of the figure, and not to lose this motion or its natural life to the finishing of their drawing. Gorey suggests not to spend too much time setting up the model and to use a print, drawing, or picture of some eminent master as reference for the arrangement of the pose. Additionally, Gorey advises that the model should be in healthy condition to hold an action pose and that the model must rest often so not to become too weary, lose the action, or change it slightly into another. Albrecht Dürer would say, No man shall ever be able to make a beautiful figure out of his own imagination unless he has stored his mind by much copying from life. Consistent drawing of the human figure from the life would assure confidence of skill and knowledge for the student. In the 17th century, a testimony of a genuine master artist was one who understood the entire human figure from memory, and this ability would be proven through designo drawings of the figure drawn at any angle, in any movement, and in every expression, without the need of a live model. For a Renaissance master, the live model was mostly employed for study sketches required in a narrative painting. Such drawings would also serve as reference material for future painting ideas or for students to copy. A live model, if necessary, would also be employed during the finishing of a painting, completed almost always by the master's own hand. Students had to draw and observe everything the visual world presented to them, draperies, plants, weaponry, buildings, and many ornaments, to become a universal master artist. In his Inleiding, published in 1678, Samuel van Hoogstraten mentions, Give each thing its property according to the characteristics presented by working from the life. Do not bother too much about learning handling or a manner, but do persist in becoming more certain in observation. Thus the hand and the brush will become subordinate to the eye in order to properly depict the diversity of things, each in its own fashion, in the most graceful way. Surface perceptibilities of objects were an important consideration. Using any drawing media, the picture drawer was to make satin look shiny or stone appear smooth, solid, or jagged, or leaves delicate and flowing. To the 16th and 17th century mindset, 
This was also observation, that is, depicting all the surface diversities of the visual world in a most graceful way. Animals were also very important to visually and anatomically understand. Students would sketch from farm animals, dogs running loose in the city streets, flayed rats, dead birds, even insects. The visual perceptibility of depicting various fur textures would challenge the student. Wool on a lamb, the stiff bristles on the wild boar, or the curly coat on a dog were to be convincing. Amassing sketches from the life enabled advanced students to begin a visual reference file whereby subject matter would be organized into folios. A collection of such images were essential for the compositions of future paintings yet to be realized, especially if one aspired to become a recognized guild member painter. The noble horse was also to be well observed, including its anatomy, proportions, mannerisms, and individual characteristics. The left corner image shows the ideal proportions of the Renaissance horse type, favored by the aristocracy and for warfare, and was often portrayed in grand mythological, biblical, and hunting narratives. Yet the picture drawer was to learn all horse types, their unique characteristics, and their regional distinctions, such as the Spanish jennet, the English draft horse, the French carriage horses, ponies, and palfreys. Regarding landscapes, this advice was given. Seat yourself in a wood, studious youth, and look around you, observing everything near and far. Notice how the farthest objects are less distinct than those that are near you, Notice, too, how the foreground comes towards you and how precise the leaves of the nearest trees are compared with the flowers in the distance. This drawing is an excellent example of 17th century distant grounds and the use of glowing light and shadow to achieve depth. An advanced drawing student would also apply the understanding of the grid floor, vantage point, and other concepts of linear and aerial perspectives which should now become an unconscious visual habit. One was expected to draw outside often, being encouraged to go into the country and draw some landscapes after the life, so that he may have a universal knowledge and become a general master, understanding the draft of all things. In another art manuscript by Gori, he advised an artist to travel for a few weeks per year in order to work outdoors. Here we see a painting by the French master Claude Lorraine, depicting an artist studying directly from nature. Note the toolbox on the ground, which likely stored the artist's mobile materials and drawing papers. Observations of trees, plants, and buildings were to be considered. Students, to help offset their costs of a continuing education, could also sell their best drawings through the side business of their master's art dealership. In the 17th century, the growing establishment of the art collector and art connoisseur provided lucrative opportunities for master painters like Rembrandt and Rubens to become respected art dealers. Select students' work were likely included in sales, since the art product represented the branding image of the master's successful workshop and served as an advertisement in his ability to teach fine artists. This common practice has caused some confusion today on verifying whether certain drawings were student or genuine master works, since most drawings were not signed. Aside from drawing from the life, an advanced picture drawer would also learn the rudiments of color through the painting process called limning. Limning was basically water-based paint applied either transparently or opaquely, or both, and its popularity remained among the gentry who found the media less messy over oil paints. 
many prevalent how-to manuscripts on limning were plagiarized and published for the open market, enabling anyone to learn. Of course, a solid drawing skill was necessary. By the end of the 17th century, colored chalks, known as pastilles, would become a popular, inexpensive, dry painting media. With his drawing instruction coming to an end, a talented student was immediately employable, and the demand was high, especially in the fields of print publishing and ornamental designs, which would include tapestries, stained glass, tablewares, drapery fabrics, jewelry, and furniture designs. Other boundless opportunities were in cartography, garden landscaping, interior and exterior architectural embellishments, theatrical costumes and stage settings, portrait miniatures, or being hired as a traveling artist to document the new worlds, their people, flora, and fauna. By the late 17th century, with the guild system disappearing, an outstanding picture drawer had the freedom to choose his particular special interest, providing the service of his designs to companies like a freelancer or to start up his own business. To be an excellent picture drawer was also a hallmark of a certain social standing and of a well-educated achievement, a pastime for gentle men and gentle ladies, since drawing was recognized as necessary to all people who use their intellect, since vision and judgment are greatly enlightened by the art of drawing. However, for the picture drawers continuing their studies into painting, they completely understood that the first fundamental principles consist in the art of drawing, which itself paints without pigment and depicts the most important things in nature. Drawing is considered the true foundation of the art of painting. Thus, never a day without a line.